uh, I hope you've enjoyed your luncheon as much as I did. Uh, before we get started, if I could ask that you'd please turn off your cell phones, your pagers, and other electronic equipment. I know last month I think I stood up here and wished everybody a happy spring, but today, well, I, I really am not sure what to say. So, anyway, I believe winter has made a reappearance. Uh, let's hope the rest of the week just continues to get just a little bit better and a little bit better because I think Mother Nature was just teasing us a little bit the other day with the 80 degree or 85 degree. It was, it was quite nice. Typical springtime in Kentucky. So uh, it's nice to see everyone. Welcome back to Food for Thought and a special welcome to those of you who are new with us today. We certainly hope you've enjoyed yourself and come back and join us again. Um, many of you, and I have to include myself in this statement, uh, probably have family members who were in the medical field. I had an aunt that was an, our nurse in World War II, and she served as a public health nurse for many, many years after the war. So I always uh, had a special place for her in, in our family as far as being in the medical field. Uh, so with that being said, we hope that you'll join us next month as Food for Thought welcomes Joanne Weaver, Professor Emeritus from the University of Kentucky College of Nursing, for an in-depth look at the history of nursing in Kentucky. That should be quite interesting. So please mark your calendars for May the 16th and join us for a brief history of nursing in Kentucky. Now, our speaker today is Tom Beal. Tom is a native Kentuckian raised on a farm in Clark County. He attended Eastern Kentucky University and is retired from the Lexington Metropolitan Police Department. He is the owner of First Vineyard Winery and Sugar Creek Resort located in Jessamine County. And he's a member of the Jessamine County Historical Society and president of the Kentucky Vineyard Society. In addition, he is a member and legislative consultant for the Kentucky Winery Association and chairman of the Kentucky River Task Force. He is on the board of directors for the Jessamine South Elkhorn Water District and member and past president of Bluegrass Lodge No. 4 Fraternal Order of the Police. Tom is also co-author of Kentucky River Boating Guide. So please join me in welcoming Tom Beal. Thank you, Ann. Uh, I always get a little bit nervous about these introductions, and uh, I'll tell you why. A friend of mine, who's actually a college roommate, asked me one time to speak to a civic group, and of course I was going to oblige him. Well, when I got there, he got up and he whipped out his paper, and he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, your speaker today will be Tom Bell. I only know two things about him. He's never been in prison, and I don't know why. <laughs> So, Ann, I like your introduction so much better. <laughs> really, I am very thankful to be here. Uh, I'm an amateur historian. I've loved history ever since as a kid. Uh, before I get started, I want to do some acknowledgments. Uh, I would love to be able to say, uh, say that I've done all this by myself, and, but the truth of the matter is, had it not been for some people, I would have never been able to figure all this out. The very first person is a Bobby Carpenter. Bobby, stand up there. Uh, Bobby, when I first found out about this, uh, it was just more than I could handle, to be honest with you. Uh, I can type about 60 mistakes a minute, so I had to have somebody to help me out with that part of it. And uh, she stepped up, and she's a wonderful researcher. She has spent hundreds and hundreds of hours going over records. We've crawled uh, through all kinds of dusty books and stuff to find out this information. So without her help, uh, patience, persistence, and telling me to keep on going, I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, the other person, Don, would you mind holding your hand up? That's Don Graham. Uh, Don lives down river from me, has a farm down there. He is a wine person. And he was up in, uh, I think it was Bloomington, Indiana, back several years ago. As a matter of fact, I think it was 2002. And Don was looking through a Butler Winery, and he saw a book there that had been written by the Butler family, and it was, I think, titled uh, Indiana Wines. Well, when he was flipping through it, the first page or first chapter or so was talking about the history of wine in the United States. And when Don got to a survey that was in that book, 
he immediately recognized it was a part of the Kentucky River. And he knew that that was where I lived. So Don purchased that book for me and gave me a call one afternoon, said, Tom, I got a book for you. So I went down to meet him and he showed me that. And I thought, well, this is really neat that the very first vineyard and winery in the United States happened to be right here in Jessamine County. So it had it not been for Don being where he was, knowing me, having a complete understanding of the river in that area, again, I wouldn't be here. So Don, thank you very much. Um, the Butler family had done a tremendous amount of research and it was so helpful in allowing me to further it. And so they done a phenomenal job of research and like I say, I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for Mark Twain. Uh, he's the guy who was talking about what I said about, you know, Nobody really introduced me that way, but Mark Twain, he's quite the character. Uh, I guess we'll get on with this. I do appreciate all these people that have helped me. Uh, the first vineyard, it was actually planted or established in 1799, the spring of 1799. And I didn't name it First Vineyard. He actually named First Vineyard, First Vineyard, in November of 1798. So when people ask me, well, did you name it because it's the first one? I said, no, he named it because it was the first one. So that's a little bit of how the name came about. Throughout history, people usually have always done something for a reason. You know, when they came to this country, there was a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it was religious persecution, political persecution, to escape the law. There's just a lot of reasons people came here. And as best I can figure, I've done a lot of research on this era of time in Switzerland. And what was going on there at this time was a peasant revolt. There had been a couple smaller ones before, but this was of much larger magnitude. The Defer family was, a, I guess you would call it the landed gentry. The father had been a mayor and a judge, had significant holdings there in Switzerland. And I think the French Revolution was pretty much fresh in everybody's mind. And if this peasant revolt really continued, there was a good chance that, first of all, they'd lose their property and maybe their lives. So Defour sent his son, John James, over here. His real name then was Jean Jacques. He Americanized it to John James. But he sent him to this country, and I think a lot of it was, was looking for a way to get out of Switzerland. Uh, while he was here, however, Napoleon comes in and uh, pretty much puts a revolt down. And then things become a lot more settled there. But I think it was time to get out of Dodge, so to speak. I think it went the wrong way, Bobby. Yeah. We're having technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the uh, Defour Mansion in Switzerland. And this, the top part up there was a 19th century water painting. The bottom part is where it's been restored, and it's now a museum there. And uh, it's in uh, Montreux. And I haven't got over there yet, but one of these days I'd like to make it. When Defer came here, uh, one of the first things he'd done, even before he got here, is so he secured about 50-some different kinds of watches over in Europe. And the reason for that, I learned, is basically he was going to use them as currency. So he had all kinds of gold watches, silver watches, 100-case watches, you name it. So he brings these with him and when he comes over. And then when he gets here, one of the first things he does up in the New England area is he starts trading some of these watches for manufactured goods. And when I say manufactured goods, it's things that you're not going to find in the West. That's what we were considered then. It'll be things like calico and ribbons, farm implements, and things like that. So he goes from the watches to trading it to refined manufactured goods you can't get here. And the reason for that is he's looked pretty much all over New England for a place to put a vineyard and winery. And he's also hoping to find something that's already established because there's no sense reinventing the wheel. So after he basically has looked all over that area, he ends up up in Philadelphia. And he's going to get a flatboat, and he's going to load this stuff on a flatboat, and he's going to go down the Ohio River looking for a place to put a vineyard and winery. So he goes all the way down to the area of what's now St. Louis, Missouri, and nowhere along the line does he find what suits him. And any time he's ever been told that there was something, come to find out it was a goose chase. There wasn't a vineyard or winery there. After he gets all the way down into St. Louis, he realizes, well, doesn't look like I'm going to have much luck with this. 
he buys six and a half tons of lead to bring back up the river. And I thought, holy Michael, why in the world would you want to try to take all that lead back up the river? Apparently, he had been a serious student of history and found out that uh, the, the difference between us and England was not over and probably anticipated that there would be a little bit following on that and made, needed bullets. If you need bullets, you need lead. So he starts back up the, uh, the Ohio River, and it was sort of interesting, I think, on there it talks about how much he even paid the people that were the oarsmen and the captain on this flatboat. Now, that was quite the journey. He takes this lead all the way from the St. Louis area all the way up to Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and places like that, along the way selling it. He puts, sometimes he'll put it on consignment in stores. He trades it for things. So he's been all the way down, all the way back, and one of the other things he was doing while he was going along there is he was doing surveys. And DeFour was also a civil engineer. And he does some extraordinarily accurate surveys. And you'll see some of this here in a little while. Okay, Ms. Bobby. The property itself, we traced it back from our ownership all the way back, of course, to the state of Virginia. Uh, the original person who owned this was a fellow by the name of William Hazelrig. And it was a treasury warrant for 750 acres. Okay. Okay, here's a scaled down survey. And the survey was done by Daniel Boone. And the Cleveland brothers was his chainman. And that 750 acres, when it was later broke up, turned out to be about 1,100 and something. So he was not necessarily the most accurate surveyor in the world. <laughs> However... Come to find out, William Hazelrig and he were related. So it might have been a, a generous survey, shall we say. Okay, this is the deed that was the first deed that was ever issued for the property itself. And the thing that made it unique, of course, is Patrick Henry signed it. He was the governor of Virginia at that time. The city of Quantico, you know, I wonder why in the world, after traveling all over the place, that he decided to actually stop where he did and create this vineyard and winery. I think one of the main reasons is that there had been a landing and a shipping port there since like the 1780s. So they actually preceded him being there by about 15 years. This is sort of a historical place there where the, uh, the landing was. One time, Salter's Tavern and Hotel and I've done quite a bit of research on Quantico, and a friend of mine done even more. And at one time, it had hundreds of storage buildings there. It had uh, powder mills, grist mills. It had just, a, it was a thriving commercial hub. And even to this day, if you go to look at a, a map of Garrett County, you'll see five roads coming down to that, which is nothing anymore. But anything in central Kentucky at that time basically was going to come down to that shipping port. There's also two roads on the Jessamine County side, my side, that came down to that port. So there were seven roads that led down to this little town called Quantico that nobody's ever heard of. It was real interesting when I went over there. I got permission from the landowner to take pictures and sort of poke around. And I noticed the, the, old, the old stable behind it, that thing's over 200 feet long. And it's just one stable after another, or just one stall after another. And occasionally it's what's going to be probably a tack room or a feed bin. Well, come to find out, and it made sense after a, I read another book, this particular area has mountains on each side or hills on each side. It's about a 600 feet from the ridge down to where this is at. So no matter which way a stage was going, he was going to do a very, very steep, long uphill climb. They used to call it the big pool. So this was the perfect place. People could get on, they could get off, they could spend the night. This is where they would change the horses over before they started trying to go back up 600 feet of elevation. Okay, now DeFerris looked all over the place. He comes back and he ends up here in Lexington. And he does not have the money to really get this thing off the ground. So what he does is he basically puts a business plan in the Kentucky Gazette, which is a Lexington newspaper. In this, what he basically does is he tells them who he is. He tells them what his background is. He tells them what he wants to do. He tells them how much money it's going to take to do it. 
and he actually projects this business plan from 1799 all the way through to 1806 as far as the quantity of wine that should be produced and the money that the people who's actually a subscriber or stockholder would receive. This was really a, a neat thing when I was digging through the old, old records there. I found a court order where a fellow by the name of uh, Walter, I think it was Baylor, and uh, I think one of the Pattersons, they go up to uh, the fiscal court and they said, we'd like to have a road from what's now Nicholasville down to the vineyard. And back during that period of time, I was reading this, and there was farmers and stuff that would ask for roads for years and years, and they would continue it generally and come back some other time and know. And because, you know, first of all, you had to clear something. Secondly, some of these farmers didn't particularly care about a road being put through their property for several reasons. Well, they asked for it in August of 1799. In September of 1799, they start clearing this road out. And I thought, wow, that is pretty quick. I, I couldn't quite get a handle on why they would do something so fast until I found out a little bit more. And you'll understand why they got this road here in a few minutes. This, this vineyard and winery was actually established by an act of law in November 1799. Basically, it, it now would be a corporation because what it does is it lays out almost everything that a modern day corporation has in it. You know, what the obligations are. And uh, the thing was really, when I was reading this thing, it said that all the records or contracts would be kept in the Kentucky Court of Appeals. And I thought, well, boy, that's unusual to have contracts in the Kentucky Court of Appeals. So I called and said, I'd like the copy of this contract down there. And I wasn't getting much of a reception. They kept saying, well, this is just a depository for judicial matters. And I said, well, I think you're supposed to have this contract. Make a long story short, they did look, and I'm so thankful that they did, because they found it, and they sent me a certified copy of it. Because I figured if they said it in that old law book, it probably happened. Now, I didn't know if it'd still be there or not, but it should have happened. Okay, uh, this is what I found, or what they found. And this is the contract, and the contract was basically between Defour and the subscribers or stockholders of the society, the Vineyard Society. And at first, I thought all this was was going to be an endeavor where he was going to raise grapes, make wine, they were going to sell it and split the profits. But then when I got to reading this contract, it went much deeper than that. In this contract, it says that any subscriber may send any of their sons to First Vineyard, where they will be taught the entirety of vine dressing. In other words, everything from site selection to bottling, and they're to receive a thousand plantings. So what this was going to be was not only a winery, it was going to be the nucleus of an entire industry. This is the names of some of the people who was involved in it. I'm sure most of you are familiar with about the first three there. Um, you got James, who was an attorney, and John, who was the first congressman for the state of Kentucky. And Sam Brown was the dean of medicine. His real name was Samuel. He was the dean of medicine for Transylvania University. And as you go on down through there, I'm sure you'll recognize a lot of these, and I wouldn't even begin to try to tell you the, the story on all of them. But George Nichols, he was the dean of law for Transylvania University. Uh, I think you're probably familiar with Henry Clay. And what was so funny about this, Henry Clay had just graduated from William and Murray Law School, and he couldn't afford a whole share, so he had to split a share with another fellow, James Russell. But I'm sure if you're historians, you can look over this, and you can see there was a governor was involved, both congressmen were involved, there were seven members of the House of Representatives. I mean, you can just go on and on and on. It was like who's who in the state of Kentucky. Plus, there was also even merchants all the way up in Philadelphia who bought stock in it. So this was the subscribers here. And, uh, oh, yeah, that was my, like, six-time removed grandfather, Walter Bell. <laughs> And I had tracked him back, and I knew that he had a lot of landings. He had one down the Rolling Fork. He had another one, a little place called Warwick. And, but I did not realize that he was a member of it. Uh, this is what a stock certificate looked like. Uh, whoops. <laughs> That's what it did look like. Okay, here we go. 
That was issued to Robert Alexander, and Robert Alexander was a very wealthy Scotsman who uh, came over and purchased a lot of property. He also was a, a mercantile person there in Lexington. And uh, this is just an example of one of the stock, and it's actually right here at the Kentucky Historical Society. Okay, in 1801, uh, there were several other families who was going to come over. Uh, Defers, the remainder of his family, with the exception of his wife and his infant child, all the rest of the Defers came over here, and the Borales, the Moreaus, the Bettons, uh, the Siebenthals, they all came over here and worked at uh, the vineyard here for the next couple years. Okay, I told you about him being a surveyor. The guy was also an inventor. Uh, during this thing, I have probably learned to appreciate him about more than anybody I've ever read about because he is just so ingenious. The man's so far ahead of his time, I doubt seriously a lot of people even knew what he was talking about. But this is an example of where he was uh, figured out a way to dry grain, which was a big thing during that period of time. And he's asking people not to copy it because it's his. Cheese making. Here's where they're advertising for cheese or for milk to make cheese. So they're making Swiss cheese down there too. This is fairly significant, even though it's actually up in Indiana. What was going on? They was only able to secure actually 633 acres. Now you had all these Swiss families who had planned to come here and start their own farming endeavors. So what happens is. Defer goes before the United States Congress and sort of cuts a deal with them. He says, I would like a parcel of property on the Ohio River in what's now Switzerland County. And he offers to write a book if they will give him, I guess you call it special privileges, in other words, a much longer time to pay for the property. Because at that time, if you purchased property, you only had so many years to pay for it. And he really felt like they would need a longer term. Well, they did allow him to do it. And he, in turn, did, in fact, write a book called The American Vine Dresser's Guide. That's the book he wrote, and it was published in 1826 up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, this is uh, where the first wine from a commercial vineyard and winery was actually drank. It was in 1803, I think it was March, yeah, March 1803, and it was at John Postleway's Tavern in Lexington. Now, i tell you what's there now. The government building is there now. That's what's taking its place. Uh, it was it was really interesting reading. Uh, it told who some of the people that was there, and most, of course, the menu members of the society was there. And then you had all these uh, congressmen and all these representatives, people who basically made their living by talking. So their oratorical skills was amazing. I mean, they come up with some of the most flary toasts you've ever seen. There was nine of them, I think, and the first six is pretty eloquent. After that, they do go downhill. <laughs> I think maybe they might be getting a little bit snockered. <laughs> but this is, if you want to know where the very first wine in the United States was drank from a commercial winery, this is it. Okay, uh, everybody wanted Thomas Jefferson to give a blessing to their wine. So what happens here is Henry Clay, of course, you got to remember now, he's both their attorney and a stockholder. He is trying to get money together to send wine to Thomas Jefferson up in Washington, D.C. So he's basically uh, leading on some folks to give them some more money. And he's 19 more dollars in order to make the money up to where they can transport these two five-gallon oak cask of wine to Jefferson. And he gets it, by the way. <laughs> so they get the money together. And what happens is uh, John Brown, who's a congressman, writes a very nice letter of introduction that the Defers are going to take with them to Thomas Jefferson. And, Bob, if you don't mind, go ahead and flip it. Okay, yeah, let's tell a little bit more. If you want to read it, we'll give you a second there. Basically, what it's saying is this is wine from First Vineyard. And, of course, he talks about them having a place now up in Ohio. And they, he would really like for him to try it and give them some advice on it, critique it for them. Okay. Well, Jefferson does. And this is a letter coming back. He thanks them for the wine, and uh, he critiques it. He says the wine is green, and it is. I mean, it's from last year's harvest. And he says well, what he wants to do, he wants to sell it, and he's going to try it again in six months, a year, and at two years. And one of the things that I thought was pretty neat, he was such a purist that one of the very last things he asked is down there is P.S., 
He wants to know if this stuff has been fortified with any kind of spirits because it was quite common during that time to add brandy to wine. And it wasn't just for the alcohol content. This was a time when they didn't have a lot of the technology we have today. So if this wine got real hot, there was a good chance he was going to have some kind of bacterial infection that was going to affect either its smell, its taste, or both. But he didn't think you ought to do that to wine, so he was wanting to know if it was fortified, and it wasn't. The, uh, there was numerous attempts at making vineyards in this country. I mean, it goes all the way back to when people were first coming here from England, because the thought was at that time is this was going to be a place where England could grow grapes and make wine. Little did they know, but the indigenous American vines had a great deal of resistance to the diseases that were already here and the pests. Well, everybody would bring the European vines over, try a European vineyard, and of course they would fail. And the reason they failed usually was because of disease or a little old thing called phylloxera root louse. Well, finally, there was one that, that did make it. And this is the one that DeFour started the industry with. Now, he also tried 35 other different species, and all of those died. There was only two that made it, uh, this one here that he called the Cape, because he thought it was from the Cape of South Africa. It was sold to him by a French attorney who told him that, and he didn't really have any reason to doubt him at that time. But what it actually was, it's a, it's a hybrid, it's an accidental hybrid, natural occurring. And it came from the Schuylkill River. Uh, William Tell, or William Penn rather, came over here, he was the governor of Pennsylvania, and he had a vineyard put out, and it was all vinifera. Of course it died out. Uh, his gardener, I guess you say, or his viticulture person was named Alexander, his last name was. And he recognized that this grape was making it. So he basically just started propagating the vineyard with this grape in order to have grapes for wine. At about, oh, 1831, a fellow by the name of William Robert Prince up in New York, he was a horticulturist, he realized that this particular grape had about a half a dozen regional names. So he says, okay, what we're going to do, if you will send me a, a piece of the vine, a leaf, a seed, and all that, I'm going to try to standardize in some of these things. So he takes it from being all these different names to finally they call it the Alexander. Now that's important for one reason, to me at least. When I was doing the research on this, I was trying to find the Cape Grape. And couldn't everybody, uh, even Thomas Piney, who's a wonderful author on history of grapes, he thought it was extinct. And I had about given up, and I thought, well, I'm going to call the USDA during Plasma Depository and just say, hey, y'all got any seed for this particular type of grape? And I called up there, and sure enough, they had two of these vines because everybody was using the wrong name. They was looking for the Cape grape. They didn't realize in 1831 the name of it had been changed to the Alexander. So they sent me 40 cuttings from these two vines up there. And we put them out that year, and 37 of them have survived, and now we're taking cuttings from them. And we're going to propagate to where we've got maybe 150 vines. But it was I'm so thankful I read that book because I was able to realize the grape still exists. It's just a different name. And I have found out since that that's true with many, many species. It goes back to that time. They were called by numerous names, regional names. And a lot of the times, you know, they change the name and they're dropped. And it was quite common. Like this, this vine right here started in most all the other vineyards after this until the Catawba came along, which is another hybrid. And it was a much more productive grape. And that's why this grape sort of fell by the wayside. Okay. People have asked me, they said, well, what about the quality of the wine? Well, nobody's made it since about 1860-something, so I couldn't honestly tell them much about it. But in, <laughs> I wasn't there, contrary to popular belief. Uh, I've read a book called Jefferson and Wine, and John Adlam, who was a winemaker up in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, was making wine at this time for this particular grape, the Alexander grape. And Jefferson spoke very highly of it. He says, if we ever have an industry in this country, That'll be the group that's going to start it. And he, he liked it. He said it would compare it to anything in France. Now, he may have been saying that just because they wanted to sell wine, too, so I'm not going to tell you how good it is. I was telling you about him being, uh, John James, before being a surveyor, a civil engineer. What happened was, saw Peter mine down uh, 
in Rockcastle County. It was then Madison, but it's now Rockcastle. The uh, Browns got involved in this. They bought up a part of it along with some other folks because they knew the War of 1812 was coming too. Everybody knew that it wasn't over. And saltpeter is one of the three ingredients in black powder. Well, one of the first things they done when they purchased this thing is they hired John James DeFour to go down there and survey it for them. And I never will forget when I was reading his diary and he was talking about going to work in a saltpeter mine, I thought, what in the world? Because that was not normally something you'd want to do. Well, come to find out what he was doing was surveying it. And I, to emphasize how good his survey is, I found a 1990, I think it was 1993 map where they had resurveyed this. If you overlay the two, there's no disparity whatsoever in any of this. He was dead on. He'd done this with a torch and a monopod. I mean, it's just amazing that he could do it that accurate. Okay, 1806. John James is going to go back to Switzerland and pick up the rest of the family that he's left over there, the wife, the father, and his infant child. So he gives his pair of attorney to his uh, brother, his younger brother, John James, or John uh, David. No, he was John Francis. That's who that was. That was John Francis de Four. Anyhow, this is his pair of attorney turning over the vineyard to his younger brothers. Oh, okay, this is 1806. There was also wine taken from First Vineyard to James Madison. I'm going to have to hustle on this one, I think, probably. Uh, a real quick one. This is a neat thing. This is a young man by the name of John Stewart. Uh, he's wanting to go on an adventure, and he makes a deal with the flatboat captain. He says, if you'll let me go to New Orleans with you, I'll help you on the boat ride. So he agrees to. And uh, the gentleman was articulate, and he was educated because his diary is, I mean, it's well written. But I could tell he had been uh, pretty sheltered because he says, I just can't believe how crude these people are. They're drinking and they're swearing and they're fighting. And he was talking about the river guy. <laughs> you know, you don't fall in with a rougher bunch than that. But at any rate, he sticks it out. And what happens is they sit along for, they sit there at Cleveland Landing, which is now Clay's Ferry, for a long time. And the rain, spring rains will not come. It's, and so the, he's almost ready to go back home. Finally, it starts raining, and it rains, and it rains. Well, as they're coming down through there, he says, in his diary, he says, it's risen 30, foot, 30 feet perpendicular. Then he says, it's a raging monster. And then he says, it's 50 feet perpendicular. And finally, their boat is breaking up, apparently. And he says, we have finally managed to land a mile below the vineyard. And they're going back up to the vineyard to ask, he thinks they're French, to ask the French people for tools to repair the boat. So here's a chronology on that. He gets up there, and he thinks they're French. He asks for tools, and they, of course, loan them to him. He returns the tools. Now he finds out they're Swiss because he found out a little gal by the name of Maria de Four. That's John James's younger sister's there. And uh, he gets quite smitten with her, shall I say. But he realizes they've got to get, gotta get out of here because now when that water goes down, you're stuck until the next freshing, it's called a tide, different things. So, but at the last thing there, he says, Maria still runs in my mind. So he was still thinking about this lady. I presumed that he was going to come back and marry her. So I read through his diary. He goes all the way down to New Orleans. And then he walks back up the Natchez Trail, almost dies from either, I would say, yellow fever or malaria. Because a couple of Indians find him and save his life. Because I guess he's running a very high fever and everything. He gets back. I go down. Well, yeah, she got married, but it was an arranged marriage to one of the other Swiss guys there at the, at the winery. So he wasn't allowed to marry her. But I'm going to shorten this a little bit. When they left First Vineyard and went up to Indiana, guess who bought the farm next to him? John Stewart. He followed that woman for the rest of his life. Uh, this was... One of the, that was the only person that was born there. There were several marriages there, but Perrette de Four was uh, born there in 1807. And he talks about he was born at the first vineyard. Then they went to Vivi, and they referred to it as a second vineyard. And the, the thing I got to do a little more research on here, there were several marriages. There was three that I remember. There was one birth and there was one death. One of the people that came over, John Borali, got kicked in the head by a horse while they were clearing the vineyard and died. His wife later, I tracked her. She ended up moving Garrett County and having a couple children over there. Uh, the way we really 
nailed this vineyard down. There's several different ways. When we got to researching this, one of the first things we done was we looked at all the correspondence of the day, the newspapers and things like that. A lot written about this because it was a big happening at this point in time. The only way you got wine was basically to import it, and it was a very expensive thing to do. So there was a lot written about it. One of the things that probably nailed this down for us was a fellow by the name of Liberty Hyde Bailey. He was a horticulturist, and he traveled throughout the United States, and he was basically cataloging the indigenous fruits. And I guess he had a, an interest, a real interest in First Vineyard and the history of it, because he comes there and he spends several days. He goes into great detail about this place, where it's at, the rock formation, and things like that. And in this book, they talk about the vineyard and the buildings, and they talk about it being on the Salter, S-A-L-T-E-R track, Michael Salter. So we knew what track of property it was on, and we also had a bunch of other things that we knew from reading newspaper articles. It talks about a rock wall around it, and it talks about the terracing. Well, we already knew that the terracing was there. We knew the rock wall was there. We knew the distance was right. It says it's directly below the mouth of Sugar Creek. So we was about 100% sure. But finally, we've got somebody that's naming the very piece of property that this is on. This is one of the other newspaper articles. This is where it talks about and on a hill slope and it's just below the mouth of Sugar Creek. In other words, these are some of the things that we already had figured out and found before we actually found out where the track of property was. Defer done a very wonderful survey. I took this particular survey and I made a, a Mylar copy of it and I reduced it down to the aerial photographs that the PVA office had. And when I superimposed it over it, there was no deviation at all in that river. I was able to take this. Do we have the next? Yeah. I was able to take this and figure out where every track of property was. And I pulled all the deeds so I could research where all of it was. If you, I guess it's the, yeah, right there. Bobby's got the arrow on it. That's the Michael Salter track. So what I've done is I took this mylar, laid out all the properties on it, and then when I laid it over the PVA, the vineyard's right in the middle of the Michael Salter track, and that happens to be where we're at. So now I knew that there was no doubt where that vineyard was because we could actually show it with his survey. And when I was doing the research, I went and got the Michael Salter deed, and down there highlighted in yellow, it says right in it, commonly called the vineyard track. So I think that's about 100% proof at that point. I'm going to have to flip through these a little faster. I'm, my timekeeper just told me, <laughs> this is what it looked like in 2007. This is where the old winery was. This is the Cape Grape as it's being grown now at First Vineyard. The mulberries, I'll explain that. He was starting a silk industry, and he had put these mulberries out to feed to the silkworms. He, Don's laughing. He's read it. He carried a snuff can under his armpit for days hatching silkworm eggs out. <laughs> I'll tell you, this guy was something else. But he did. He, he got this all started, buddy. He said, then he found out, wait a minute, you got to have people do this. Well, there was nobody living in Kentucky. <laughs> uh, like, never figured out what this was. And finally, I read another book called The uh, Settlement of Switzerland County. One of the guys there, the Siebenthal, Louis Siebenthal, was a blacksmith. And he talks about he actually forged multi-pronged cultivating holes for the defer. So we finally figured out what that thing was. I, it looks like a huge frog gig. <laughs> uh, this one was another one we found, and an old building that had collapsed. It's a single tree, and a single tree is what it's used for. Usually the hook's there, either a piece of leather or a chain goes over it, and then the other thing there can attach to an implement. Well, I had a pair of Belgian draft horses, and there's single trees about this big. This one's about this big. I thought, what in the world would you use that thing for? And finally, uh, a Swiss fellow up in uh, Kettering, Ohio, Layman's, there a Swiss family that came over about the same time the Fours did, and they started a mercantile store, and the family still has it. And I'm explaining what this is, and he laughed. He said, yeah, I know what it is. I said, well, what in the world is it? He said, it's a single tree for a goat. I said, a goat? <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, the Swiss would not allow a heavy-footed animal, being a horse or whatever, or oxen, in the vineyard. They didn't want the earth compacted. And I said, well, boy, I'd have never thought about that. And he said, I still got goat wagons and harness. I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, <laughs> really, you want one? And he still does. You can still get a goat wagon and harness for a goat from them. 
This was used for vine cutting. We like to never figure it out this thing either and the only way I did finally I was uh, searching the internet and there's a fellow out in California who rents props to the movies and stuff like that on vineyards well what it was this thing is meant for mass cuttings off of vines at one time then I got to thinking about it you know you remember all them guys was going to get a thousand cuttings that'd take a long time with a pruning knife so you could take this thing bend the vine over it's actually hinged and got a pin you can pull the pin out, get the vine in it, put the pin in, and when you come down with it, you cut about as many, you know, in other words, you would cut probably 30 or 40 at a time off. Now it made more sense how that's going to come up with 150,000 vine cuttings. This is uh, First Vineyard, 2008. And that was an ice storm that I was worried to death about, but it didn't hurt them. I'm very thankful. There's a 2010. And you can see the terracing. This is the tasting room. And we put it back, it's about a 16 by 16, because that was a common size cabin. 16 by 16, 16 by 20 was about what most of them were. That's a pavilion over there to the side. Whoop. <laughs> what we're doing is the first production of this particular grape, when we get it ready, I'm having uh, glasses blown down in Louisville. Highland Glass Company said that they would try to blow them for me. They've blown me a couple prototypes, and we've done a lot of work on the color and everything, because back during that period of time, they called it black glass. It was actually green, but it was such a dark green, it looks black. So we're, we're doing some work on that. We're working on the etching and all that. So hopefully down the road here one of these days, we're going to be able to come out with, we're going to probably do about 250 bottles of them. Okay, did I make it in time? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's my clock man down there. <laughs> okay, basically, uh, this is a presentation right here. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And if we don't have the time to answer all of them, I'll stay afterwards. Feel free to come up. And if I know the answer, I'll tell you, okay? Anybody got any questions? No questions? I can't believe it. I've never been that lucky. <laughs> right, right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Interesting, interesting topic of, of vineyards in Kentucky. Uh, thank you so much for coming this afternoon. Let's hope that next month it'll be just a little bit warmer. Uh, but come back and join us next month for our uh, brief history of nursing in Kentucky. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. <laughs>